kind of coming in um, as we start a little bit, but it is 12.03 and we like to be on time for this. And I know some students have class right after this, so they do need to leave um, promptly. I'm Marissa Brown. I'm the, direct, uh, the Assistant Director for Programs at the John Nicholas Brown Center for Public Humanities and Cultural Heritage. Um, thanks for being here today. We're really excited to welcome Joby Hill. This is the second of our fall lunchtime speaker series called Public Humanities Now, New Voices, New Directions. Um, I actually reached out to Joby, I think in the spring, um, and we were going to do a summer talk and uh, got moved to the fall. And so we have now been looking forward to this for, I don't know, maybe seven months or six months or so. So we're really excited to have her. Um, I'm going to introduce Joby, and then I just wanted to let everyone know who is here today, um, how we will structure this, given that we're all on Zoom together. Um, after Joby starts, you, what you can do is you can, if you have a question as Joby's speaking, please use your chat box. You don't have to write uh, the entire question that you have, but if you just write a little note in the chat box saying that you have a question, um, then I will keep track as the questions come in and I will sort of create a little question queue. I'll chat box back to you, let you know what number you are in the queue. And when you're up, I can unmute you so that you can ask your question um, on your own. Um, for the chat box, anything you write will only go to uh, a couple of people, me, Joby, um, and Sabina Griffin, the um, center manager, just so you know. So with that, um, I think we can begin. I will, I'll introduce Joby and then, and then she'll share her presentation with us today. Um, Joby is a licensed preservation architect. Uh, she's speaking today about a project that she started in 2012 called Saving Slave Houses. The work on this began in 2011. Um, and her work since, since then and on this project really focuses on domestic slave buildings. Uh, the research that she's doing is interdisciplinary. It examines the architecture of slavery, the influence these dwellings had on the lives of their inhabitants, and the preservation of the history of enslaved people. The primary goal is to ensure that slave houses, irreplaceable pieces of history are not lost forever. Um, she has, well, the bio I have, this may even be out of date, we'll see. Um, she has completed architectural and anthropological surveys of over 700 enslaved buildings at 140 sites across six states. Um, one of the things she's really interested in, too, is how modern technologies have changed uh, the way that field work is done. And um, she's interested in... Um, or really feels that field work uh, should include things like hand sketches, field sketches, measured drawings, but also I think things that we in the public humanities also value oral histories and interviews. Prior to starting this project um, from 24, well, not prior, I guess, from 2014 to during, I guess, part of it, from 2014 to 2017, Joby was a preservation architect at Thomas Jefferson's Monticello. She has an MS in Historic Preservation from the University of Oregon, an MA in Art History from the University of Memphis, and a BA in Anthropology from Rice University. Um, so let me see, um, let me just make sure that the tech is all set up for us. And um, just give me one second. Yeah. We're, we, are, we are good to go. So I am going to, Joby, turn it over to you. I will stop the screen share of the intro slide um, so that you can share what you need to share. How does that look on your end? Okay. Yes. Okay. Let me share. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay, great. Here we go. Okay. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'll just jump right in so we can get started. Um, let's see, real quick, sorry, let's see, so I'm gonna real quick start my video and then, okay, all right, let's see, let's see if we gotta get it, make sure it's going, there we go, okay, yes, 
Uh, yeah, so as Marissa said, so yeah, so for the last um, eight years, my um, research and professional work has focused exclusively on enslaved buildings. Um, and um, in 2012, I started an independent project titled Saving Slave Houses, and with the primary goal to ensure that slave houses, which are irreplaceable pieces of history, are not lost forever. Um, but also to change the way that we think, talk, research, document, interpret, preserve, restore, teach about, and learn from slave houses. So, you know, just a few things I'm trying to take on, but all very important. So one of the most important components of my Saving Slave Houses project is the Slave House Database. And the Slave House Database represents a comprehensive national architectural an anthropological study of slave houses in the United States. Through the database project, a vast array of information about slave houses is collected and housed in a central repository. It is designed to be a crosswalk for diverse fields to analyze and interpret slave houses, as well as connect to other resources. The database is a flexible and dy dynamic tool that has the capacity to yield diversified information about slave houses that can be tailored to the user's desired outcome. It is designed to be a resource for researchers, descendants, museums, organizations, and the public to study and interpret the surviving evidence of slavery and to serve as a way to preserve and study the important but largely lost slave house. So for my research purposes, a slave house includes all enslaved spaces in which housing was one of the functions. It was very common for enslaved people to work and live in the same building. This is especially true of kitchens and wash houses because these services were always in high demand. So the Slave House database has two parts, documentation and interpretation. The documentation is the visual rep rep representation of spaces, and the interpretations are descriptions of the spaces from the actual inhabitants who lived and worked there during slavery. The architectural drawings and images of slave houses represent a snapshot in time. In this context, slave houses are considered artifacts. And like all artifacts, they can convey important messages about their makers, occupants, and users. The most direct way of getting at an accurate interpretation of the uses, activities, and feelings associated with historic slave houses is through the accounts left by formerly enslaved people themselves. The narratives recorded from formerly enslaved people breathe life into the two-dimensional drawings and photographs of slave houses. My research involves examining both the historical record and material culture. I've completed over 700 architectural and anthropological surveys of enslaved spaces across the US. In addition to field work, I've conducted extensive research and detailed analyses of materials in the largest collections of documented slave architecture in America. They are the interviews collected by historically black colleges and universities in the late 1920s, the slave narratives collected in the 1930s, the architectural surveys completed by the Historic American Building Survey since 1933, the Virginia Historical Inventory Project in 1937, and the research and documentation carried out by the Architectural Research Department at the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation since 1980. Having seen firsthand hundreds of slave houses, as well as studying them from an interdisciplinary perspective, I'm able to offer an exclusive perspective about the structures and inhabitants of slave houses. The Historic American Building Survey, or HABS, was a government program established in 1933 for relief employment under the Work Progress Administration, or WPA. HABS was able to employ 1,000 qualified architects and grafts, draftsmen to record historically significant buildings in the United States. The purpose of the survey was to obtain a complete record of the architectural features of buildings. Photographs were intended to supplement the measured drawings and not serve as the only form of documentation. But for 60% of the slave house sites, a photograph turned out to be the only type of documentation. Only 14% of the HABS documented slave houses have both a measured drawing and a photograph. The Virginia Historical Inventory, or VHI, is a collection of photographs, maps, and detailed reports documenting the architectural, cultural and family histories of thousands of 18th and 19th century buildings across Virginia. The project was created in 1937 by the Virginia Writers Project, a branch of the WPA. Unlike HABS, 
which documented prominent historical structures, the VHI was specifically charged with documenting the vernacular architecture and history of everyday buildings built before 1860. The VHI created architectural descriptions of 396 slave houses. Of these, 28% also have a photograph. A bonus feature of this project is that during eight surveys, they also recorded narratives from formerly enslaved people and photographed two of the women as pictured here. Extensive research on slavery has been conducted by the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, or CWF, over the decades. Since 1980, the Architectural Research Department has been actively conducting architectural surveys and historical research of enslaved spaces as part of the Agricultural Buildings Project, making it one of the largest collections of documented slave houses. The vast knowledge of the architectural historians and the immense level of detail put into the drawings and reports makes the collection at Colonial Williamsburg unparalleled. I was awarded the Fellowship in African and African American History and Culture from Colonial Williamsburg for four years in a row. For my fellowships, I worked with the architectural historians to digitize the entire Agricultural Buildings Project collection. I scanned over 5,000 5, measured, measured drawings, field notes, photographs, and written reports. CWF has surveyed over 700 U.S. sites. Of these, over 200 sites have an enslaved building. The interpretation portion of the database includes descriptions of the slave houses and the activities that took place there from the actual enslaved people living there during slavery. The largest and most widely known collection of narratives is the Federal Writers Slave Narratives Project. The Federal Writers Project, the WPA program, was established in 1935 and was designed to provide jobs for unemployed historians and writers. One of the assignments for the Writers Project was to collect American life histories from people of all backgrounds. One type of narrative that was of great interest to John Lomax, the director of the Writers Project, was the interviews with formerly enslaved people. In 1937, the official Slave Narratives Project was created. At the end of the Slave Narratives Project, more than 2,300 first-person accounts of slavery and 500 black and white photographs of people once enslaved in the U.S. had been collected by the Writers Project from 17 states. Black scholars have always been at the forefront of collecting and telling African American history in the United States. Even though their work often goes unrecognized for decades or longer, without them, some of the greatest scholarly works would have never even come into fruition, such as the Federal Writers Slave Narratives Project. One of the leaders in, this, in the systematic collection of oral histories from formerly enslaved people was John B. Cade. By working at Southern University and then Prairie View State College, Cade conducted around 500 interviews in more than 17 states. Just recently, a collection of narratives at Southern University became available online. The original 1929 set of narratives, which was compiled at Southern University, was destroyed, according to a letter from Cade on February 13, 1935. The newly available set of narratives is the 1935 Prairie View State College collection. This collection contains 229 narratives from 17 states. Of these 229 narratives, 121 describe their house during slavery. The kind of the primary difference between the two narratives is that the WPA questions tend to invoke responses that describe the building, while the Cade questions tend to get responses that were more emotional. So on the next slide is a series of, res series of responses from both of the WPA narratives and the John B. Paid narratives. Um, I'm, I'm just going to have you read them for yourselves. Um, as you're reading them, I want you to notice both how they tried to record the dialect and also just uh, get, an, uh, get a sense of what it's like to work with each of the collections. Joby, did you want to be back on the previous slide so people could read those letters? No. Oh, I see. Got it.
Slavery was different for every single person who experienced it, free, freed, or enslaved. There are broad patterns and similarities between daily life of the enslaved from one site to the next. And in order to truly begin to understand the human dimensions associated with, with slave houses, one must carefully consider the descriptions given by someone who actually lived and worked in these buildings. Narratives from formerly enslaved people provide insight into the uses, activities, and feelings associated with the historic slave house. Details that fuse a voice about the human condition with a physical structure. The anthropological history in combination with the preservation of the historic slave house reveals a part of history that cannot be gleaned from the historical record alone. My methodology, which I call in their own words, is able to identify the ex-slave narratives that describe a specific documented slave house. In this context, the house where the person lived during slavery is the same house that is featured in the image. Of the 485 HAB sites with a documented slave house and the 1,010 Writers Project narratives that describe their house during slavery, only five documented slave, house, slave houses from the HABS collection can be direct, directly linked to an ex-slave narrative recorded by the Writers Project. My favorite example of the five match sites is the Taylor Plantation in Alabama. It is a rare HAB site that can be matched to the ex-slave narrative, narrative of Jane Holloway. This site is also exceptional because not only is there a narrative about life in the Taylor Plantation, but a photograph of Jane was also taken during the interview, and it survives. This site and Jane's interview provide insight into the lives of enslaved people on a small plantation. During slavery, Jane lived with her mother, Carrie, her father, Taylor, and her brother, Maryland. Jane and her family lived in a one-room log house. She remembers that the room itself was not very big, but the fireplace was. Recalling the large fireplace made Jane think of spending time with her family, the meals they ate together, and how precious these times were while she was growing up. The Slave House database also includes new current documentation for each of the slave houses. This documentation represents survey, survey work that I have completed and will continue to do. To date, I've completed surveys of approximately 700 buildings at over 150 sites across seven states and have driven over 9,000 miles. The HABS collection has been the primary focus of my research thus far. Therefore, it will be the first collection that I complete survey work for. This phase of the survey work involves locating and resurveying the HABS documented slave houses in the US. I should note that when I am in an area surveying, I, I survey as many sites that, that I can get to, not just the HAB sites. The goals of, the, of my survey work are to one, identify which of the HABs documented slave houses still exist, two, to document the current conditions of the sur surviving structures, three, to record architectural information that is missing from the original survey and record any additional buildings that were not documented during the original survey, and four, to collect GIS coordinates for each structure. For myself, field work provides a perspective that can only be gained from personally interacting with and experiencing a space. There's no substitute for standing in a slave house and experiencing the overwhelming rush of emotions that come with it. And this slide I like to show because on the top left is the 1971 Habs photograph. Um, on the top right is a photograph taken by the owner um, before I was able to make it out there and they said they're getting ready to restore the building. Um, the bottom left is what it looked like when I got out there and the bottom right is what it looked like when they said they had finished the restoration of the building. So just kind of a note that, you know, people, people's definition of restoring a building uh, varies. So it's always something to keep in mind and also uh, shows why it's important to go back and look at these structures over time. And just because they've been documented once doesn't mean that um, it's done and you should never go back and revisit them to see what happens over time. Having a physical space to experience and interact with is one of the best ways to help people grapple with some of the complexities and harsh conditions that slavery imposed. Unfortunately, many people won't have the opportunity to experience this in person. 66% of the sites I've surveyed are privately owned. 27% of the structures have been demolished and another 5% have been abandoned. So soon they too will disappear from the landscape. 
But with the use of technology and continued determination, the story doesn't have to end here. Today, the most sophisticated documentation method is 3D laser scanning. The process of capturing the exact size and shape of an object as digital information. From this data, countless final products can be created, such as vir virtual, augmented, or mixed reality experiences, walkthrough videos, 3D models, 3D printed replicas, and measured drawings, just to name a few. Technology can offer access, interaction, and learning opportunities about slave houses by translating field work into virtual experiences that can be utilized by anyone, anywhere. Right now, I'm, I am not able to laser scan every site I survey, but I'm working very hard on making it the standard documentation method for slave houses. The laser scan slave house I'm going to show you today is from Brandon Plantation in Halifax County, Virginia. Brandon has a surviving slave house with an intact sub subfloor pit, which is rare. Pits are usually only found archaeologically. Subfloor pits are the most mysterious and intriguing feature found in slave houses because we know so little about them. They're not described in slave narratives, and there are very few accounts from slave owners about them. Therefore, it is unclear how widely known their existence was during slavery. In multifamily house, houses, it is believed that the number of subfloor pits represent the number of families living in the house. On this slide, this is the um, pit before we opened it. It was sealed about 15 years, <laughs> excuse me, before to protect it. So here is the, here's the laser scan of the pits. Here's the pit, okay. Then I have to make it small so you guys won't jump around on you. So this is the scan of the room. And this building was believed to be um, a kitchen quarter. And this room has the large of the two fireplaces. So this would have been technically the kitchen side of the building. So that's the scan of the room. And then here's the pit being examined by historians and some archaeologists. And then here is the shrink for you again. Here's the scan of the pit itself. And the opening of the pit is uh, four feet by four feet, and it's a little over four feet deep. And what's also interesting about this pit is that because the building itself is raised on piers, half of the pit is underground and the other half is above ground, which is very, very interesting. positive cultural shift in the acknowledgement of the legacy of slavery in America seems to be gaining some momentum. In order to stimulate, stimulate this momentum, assumptions made about the interpretation and preservation of the living and working environments of enslaved people need to be challenged and the methodologies used to research and interpret those environments need to be updated. At historic sites, they're adding enslaved spaces back to the landscape by building reconstructions or recreated slave houses and identifying the people enslaved there. For example, at Monticello, where I was a preservation architect and Mulberry Road project manager for four years during the Mountaintop Project, which was the big slavery restoration project, the foundation had two new enslaved buildings built, two extant enslaved spaces restored, and five enslaved rooms exposed and interpreted. This is building T, or as interpreted as John and Priscilla Hemings cabin. It took three men using historic tools and methods about six months to build it. And as you can see from uh, Jefferson's notes, notes, it took three enslaved men, Davy, Lewis, and Abram, six days to build a similar size house. Jefferson kept what he called slave rolls, which were lists of names of the people he owned. As part of the slavery at Monticello exhibits and interpretations, all of these roles and other Jefferson's, Jefferson papers were researched to identify the people he enslaved. 
from 1774 to 1826, a total of 606 men, women, and children lived in bondage on Jefferson's land holdings in five counties in Virginia. All of these people are represented here, even if their name is unknown. This is a great start, and many historic sites have followed in their footsteps. But that is all it is, a start. The job is not done, and the stories of these 606 people have not been told. They contributed and suffered way too much to only have their legacy be their name appear on yet another list. My research has taught me many things, the two most important being, first, how to look at slave houses and truly begin to understand and, appreci and appreciate them, and second, how to read between the lines in the historical record. Interpretation of slave house architecture in combination with details from the historical record and stories from actual inhabitants offer an opportunity to more fully understand and accurately interpret the life, ways, and settings of an enslaved people in America. It is crucial to analyze a slave house from the inside out, revealing the sacred space in which enslaved people could exercise some degree of control over their lives. Enslaved people controlled only the details of the architecture, not the master plan. Therefore, in order to learn about the people who built, worked in, and lived in these structures, we must focus on the details. These details reveal that a slave house is a complex, irreplaceable piece of history that embodies suffering, yet perseverance and strong family bonds. I believe the most telling detail of any slave house is the fireplace. Fireplaces epitomize the, the complexities of enslaved people and slave houses. First, they remind us how fragile and precious life is. And second, fireplaces represent a sacred space where women provided nourishment, clothing, warmth, and comfort for their families. Appreciating the landscape of slavery through the perspective of the enslaved community takes time and practice and must be done on a holistic level. This means approaching it with an open mind and a willingness to let go of preconceived ideas and beliefs about people who built and lived in these structures. It also requires the ability to accept grim and sometimes vile truths. True insight, uh, insight with, about what life was like for enslaved people can only be gained by examining how and why enslaved people made decisions, and above all, accepting their mechanisms to survive oppression. For example, history's definition of a slave owner is a person who owned or enslaved another human being. But to an enslaved person, a slave owner was also a slave breeder and trader. If a slave owner at any time forced an enslaved person to reproduce, or if a slave owner profited from an enslaved female having a child, then he was a slave breeder. And if a slave owner at any time sold or bought an enslaved person, then he was a slave trader. He didn't have to be breeding or trading enslaved people by the hundreds to bear this title. Committing this moral crime only once earned you this label. Slave owners were not shy about expressing their interest in and belief that they had the right to control the reproductive rights and schedules of enslaved women. At Monticello in Charlottesville, Virginia, Thomas Jefferson wrote, I consider a woman who brings a child every two years as more profitable than the best man on the farm. What she produces in, the, in addition to the capital while his labors disappear in mere consumption. The Macy family of Farsalia Plantation in Nelson County, Virginia, kept a stock book, which documented the details of over 350 births of enslaved women spanning more than 100 years. And at Green Hill Plantation in Campbell County, Virginia, Samuel Pennell was so proud of his slave breeding and trading activities that he built a stone slave auction block and auctioneers stand right outside his front door. It is these historical accounts and the psychological trauma they inflicted on enslaved people that we must remember when interpreting the landscape of slavery in slave houses. The relationship between the historical record and the stories of the inhabitants is crucial to our understanding and interpretation of the life, ways, and setting of enslaved people. Extant slave houses provide an opportunity to directly interact with irreplaceable pieces of history and experience some of the harsh conditions of slavery and the perpetual forms of existence firsthand. In order to walk in the footsteps of enslaved people and gain new perspectives, we must let the narratives from formerly enslaved people guide us along unfamiliar paths and trust that in the end, they will bring us greater insight and empathy.
This lesson from Caleb Craig on how to count the number of enslaved people on his plantation in South Carolina sums up this philosophy well. I'll let you read it for yourself. So I'm guessing that your first thought is that there's no way this equals 100. And also, how and why would anyone count like this? But let's just try seeing it from Kayla's perspective and see what happens. So 10 plus 10 is 20. Double 10 is 20, so that equals 40. Plus 45 is 85. Plus 15 does equal 100, just like Caleb said. To learn more about my project or contact me, you can visit my website, savingslavehouses.org. And thank you, that's it. Thank you, Joby. I, I'm sure I speak for everyone when I say I'm just I'm overwhelmed by the research, by what this project has already contributed to how we think about slavery and how we think about history and also the power, the potential power for preservation and um, the importance of, of architecture um, in, in kind of giving people a visceral understanding of these histories. Um, I don't want to take time because I know there are a lot of people who have questions. Um, so I'm going to, I'm just going to sort of play, um, you know, um, call on person. And okay. I see Dietrich uh, Neumann, who's the director of the center, has uh, the first question. Okay. Um, Joby, um, I want to follow Marisa in saying that was just incredible, really wonderful presentation. Fascinating, you know, all through I, I'm really blown away by the amount I learned in these in this half hour and great research you've been doing. I've uh, apart from complimenting you, I wanted to ask a sort of technical question. You showed this really fascinating new method. I'm a trained architect and I did a lot of surveys many years ago when we went out with string and with you know very sort of old fashioned and it took forever. <laughs> and so can you comment on these new methods, the LIDAR laser scan that looked absolutely fascinating? And it not just, it's not just a three-dimensional photograph, it's actually a model of a space. You could theoretically move around in it and understand it even better, I understand, right? Could you just tell us a little bit, how expensive is that? How much time does it save? Are there problems with it? I mean, you obviously did a lot of these surveys and is that partially the, the large number you accomplished, partially thanks to this new technology? Is that really a, a big, uh, game changer? Yeah, so the so the laser scanning equipment is, yes, the kind of the biggest part of it is that it's expensive. Um, and it does take, like any technology, it does take training to learn how to use it. Um, and then the um, second part of it is that in the field, it's not that it takes really any more time. You know, once you know how to do it, it's just setting up the equipment and then letting it run. Um, so in the field, it's not that it really takes more time when you have the people there to do it and get it done. Then after, after scanning it, there's the post-processing time, you know, but that also depends on what do you want to do with it after, you know, you're out in the field, you know, do you want to make movies? Do you want to, you know, make model, you know, it depends on what you want to do with it afterwards, how much time you kind of spend doing that. And again, who's working on it. Um, but, you know, it is much faster than having to do like, you know, a full scaled measure drawing in the field, because that, that takes weeks. That can take, you know, weeks to do and things like that. So, but yeah, I mean, one of the reasons I'm able to get as much done quickly is because of technology. You know, otherwise I wouldn't be able to do survey work by myself and gather as much information as I do without technology. So it's, it's made a huge difference. Um, Brenda, 
you're next. I'm just trying to unmute you so you can ask your question. There you go. Hi, how are you? Um, thank you, Joby. That was actually fantastic. Um, one of the things that um, I was curious about was the subfloor pit. What was that actually used for? Yeah, so subfloor pits, what archaeology has told us is that they used to store personal items, sometimes root cellars, um, really just kind of maybe a catch-all. Um, they're typically found in front of fireplaces, um, which would make them, you know, kind of like a root cellar space. Um, but they come in all different shapes and sizes. So sometimes they're just literally holes in the ground. Other times they're brick lined, wood lined. Um, they vary in shapes and sizes. Like the one I showed today, you can see that people could get inside of them. So they're, you know, very large. Um, other times they're very small. Um, so like I said, it's, it varies, but there is, there's very few written accounts of them. And so, like I said, we don't know how widely they were known to slave owners. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think mainly they were used to store personal items and as root cellars were the primary kind of two uses of them that we know of from archaeology. All right, thank you. And I actually have one more question. You had mentioned that there were 396 um, structures. Are, are there still 396 intact as of today? Uh, so 396, that was from, that number is from the Virginia Historical Inventory Project. And that was in 1937 and they, that, that's how many they recorded in 1937. So of those, um, I don't know exactly how many of those still exist. I'm working on just to figure out how many of those still survive. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yep. Rebecca? I was just, I'm very upset that um, these buildings are privately owned and people are doing whatever they want to them and do, and I mean, essentially rebuilding them as, and living in them or whatever. Um, and I'm wondering why they can't be designated as national historic sites and protected the way many buildings are here in Providence. Is that something that we could advocate for? <laughs> um, yes, and actually the, so I, so I have, um, so the fastest way a building dies is when they're not being used. So in order for a building to survive, it, it needs to be, it needs to be used. Um, you know, I, so, you know, I don't always love the way that some of these buildings are being used. Like, I don't, I don't like to see a slave house being used as like a restroom. And that happens on public sites quite often that they are turned into restrooms. Um, so, you know, on private property, sometimes they're, a lot of times they're used for storage spaces um, or things like that. Um, but, you know, so I don't, you know, I don't always love how a building's being used, but I do say that, you know, if a building's not being used, then soon it will disappear from the landscape. So it's better that it's being used for something than not being used at all. Um, so, but one of the, but yes, I would like to see there be some type of program set up, you know, at the local level, state level, national level of having programs and funding, you know, for these structures like there are for the main house. Because a, a building, you know, a building, um, architecture is architecture. So, you know, you can preserve these structures just like you can the main house. Um, and so I would like to see programs set up to provide funding so pr private property owners can protect them and maintain them just like they do their main houses. I don't think that a designation as a national historic landmark or site precludes use in general. I think, I mean, I think there are buildings on Brown's campus that, that have been repurposed in some way but are still maintained in their basic um, essence. 
So yeah. that's what I would, that's what I would want. But it's, yeah. it's really good to learn about this. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, hello. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. I'm really excited by it, um, particularly the in their own words methodology, just because, you know, being is so creative and thoughtful about how to access the direct experience of enslaved people, since so many of the resources either don't exist or are so skewed. Um, and I was wondering if as part of that methodology, you've ever worked with descendants of enslaved people that, you know, lived in these house in these homes or um you know are of the those that were interviewed by john cade or the wpa or just any work with descendants you've done i'm curious about um yeah so just through my work i have been contacted by descendants which is one of the things i was hoping for um and which is very very exciting um also because i've been contacted by some a few descendants that um, their families were enslaved on the same site. So I've been able to put them in contact with each other and, you know, hopefully they are able to, you know, help each other out and make some connections that way. Um, but yeah, so I'm just now starting to work with some descendants at a site and um, get into, you know, kind of what what they know from that was passed down in their family and you know what i have found like in the historical record and things like that which to me i just find fascinating to, you know to see what matches up what doesn't match up um and things like that but i'm now just starting to do that i have um before i i haven't really made an effort to um look for descendants because that's kind of a whole nother level of research but they have now started to come to me, which I've, which is for me easier, <laughs> um, you know, because like I said, it's just a whole nother level of research. Um, but um, yeah, so I'm just now starting to do that. And I'm really excited about that to see kind of what, what I can learn from that. And also, you know, I, to be a resource for them, to help them learn more about their family and things like that. Nancy? I think you should be unmuted now, Jakubowski. Thanks, uh, Joby. That was a great and fascinating um, lecture. I am tuned in because uh, this uh, subject kind of came to uh, my uh, uh, attention when the Globe, Boston Globe, recently did a story on um, a surviving slave dwelling up in Medford, Massachusetts. Um, it's right next to uh, something called the Royal House, which is a mansion. Um, and one of the videos that I saw was so telling where the woman involved with the restoration projects pointed out that the side of the mansion that faces the slave quarters, which is a, quite a substantial building in itself, had no windows. And so it really pointed out that they did not want to see the very people, you know, they were enslaving. And I think a lot of your work seems to deal with states in the South, but do you know of any projects aside from say that one where people are looking for these dwellings in New England and elsewhere? Because clearly the North was complicit in slavery as well. And clearly had to house people. Um, so I'm wondering if, if that's something on your radar as well. Um, yeah, so I don't, I, I don't know of, of necessarily of any other project or people looking, looking for these structures, um, like in the Northeast or anything, but I do know of structures in the Northeast. Um, and I mean, one of the things I do tell people is that one of my goals is to find a slave house in every state. Um, Cause I do believe that there probably is one. Um, I have found one in Oregon. So, you know, if I can find one in Oregon, I'm pretty confident I can find one in every state. Um, Cause slavery, slavery was anywhere 
you know, people were at the, at the time, you know, they took enslaved people with them as they traveled and wherever they, you know, slave owners went, um, they took enslaved people with them. And so they needed some place to house them. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so I think it's, like I said, that is kind of one of my goals. It just kind of takes kind of the right type of, I don't know, kind of research and I want to say luck. It's, it's not really luck, but kind of, you know, to just kind of kind of find that uh, documentation that shows you that. Um, but yes, I definitely do know of them in the in the Northeast that they were they were there. And I, I do know the site you're talking about also. <laughs> Um, also, Joe Bead said, do, do you still take, um, suggest a site? Do you, does that link still work on your website? Yes. Oh, yes. Really everyone, you want to tell people about that so that anyone, if, if people on this call, for example, can think of something they may help out? Yeah. So on my website, there's a suggest a site link. And in that you can, um, if you know of a site, you can put in as much information that you know of. Um, and then I will add it to my master list of sites um that so i can when i'm in the area um will visit it and that is that's a great way for me to learn about new sites and i learn about you know i've learned about hundreds of sites that way actually um you know new sites and you know private property owners can tell me about sites that way and even if it's just you know one you come across in your travels or something like that thank you sonia you're up. Thank you. Hi, Joby. Um, first, I'll say that this was just phenomenal. Um, I think, and um, I think one of the pieces that that just really stood out to me was how the narrative was all, was changed, I think, between WPA, because I've studied WPA before in my own research, and then with um, John Cage, and how those two pieces of information that tried to describe the same scene were starkly different. And it was almost like how we see in, and I'm an education major, that, I'm in grad school, so it's almost how we see the history and the customs and the language and everything of other ethnic groups that are totally trying to be erased. So I, I love that. Um, it loved seeing that because it just adds to the point that we need to keep these historical data to really show how communicate how the the language is is so very pertinent okay now down to my question okay so <laughs> i'm sorry i just had to point that out um my father along with my grandmother and i think my aunts they're all buried in what i was told was a family plot that has um, a lot, and, and, and there are slaves in there as well, not my father wasn't, but he was the product of the slave owner and my grandmother, so, you know, they're, yeah, so you get it. Um, but on the way to the field are a number of slave homes. And it's about five or six of them on the way to the field. So I just wanted to know if in the future, are you going to do anything with Louisiana? Because there's a rich history of, you know, French colonialism, uh, of, you know, along with the Native American people and African people all mixed up into one. And I'm a product of that called Creole. So will you be doing any work in those lands? Because it's, it's, it's very rich, not to say that any other part isn't, but will you be doing any, any work in, in Louisiana? Yes, I hope to. Yes, I, mean, I hope to make it to every state, but Louisiana is one, of the, is one of the states that has quite a few sites. So that's a, like a big project state, but yes, I hope to. Um, Ray. I think you should ask your question. Yes, hello. <laughs> um, I've got a puppy here. <laughs> um, so I wanted to uh, second what Dietrich said um, about the scanning. I think it's really interesting. My um, interest is really in public programming and um, technology and how that can sort of help. So I was wondering if you could speak more about um, just like the public face of the program and um, 
uh, the the augmented reality and mixed reality I saw people using, I think is a really interesting way to um, sort of create that sort of intimate space, even from afar. Um, so if you could talk more about that. Yeah, so the, the scanning I've done so far um, is so that one of the companies that makes the equipment is called Trimble. Mm -hmm. And so I've worked with the company um, to scan some sites. And um, in, in doing that, it gave them opportunity to test out some of their, their equipment and I got some things scanned. And, um, and I just, yeah, I think it's really important to do that because like you said, like it, it really allows anyone to participate in this type of work. Because one, I know that what I'm doing the chances of someone going back and following my footsteps is very slim or probably not going to happen um, for a lot of reasons. Like it's taken a lot of time to do um, and some of these buildings just won't be there, you know, for someone to go back to visit again. But also vis visiting these spaces is a lot, it's a lot different than just looking at them in a photograph, which, which is why I do this. You know what I mean? I, I, as soon as I figured that out, you know, it was, it was life changing for me. And I learned so much more um, being in this space than I did just seeing a photograph. And so I think it's important for people to also be able to experience that. And because of technology, we can do that. And I, I know we can, you know, people, you're doing it all the time anywhere else, you know, that's why, People love like video games that put you in that experience. And so I just think it's really important, like just to, you know, we can just bring it over into history, you know what I mean? And this be, you know, this, use those same type of technologies in teaching history. And so people can really start to understand some of the things that I'm, I'm getting, you know, out in the field. And so yeah, it's, I think it's very, very important to do. And it's, it's not, like I said, we're doing it in so many different um, applications that it's not as far fetched as it might seem, you know, it's that in, in kind of in, in academia, it, it is, you know, because they're not, academia is not used to using cutting edge technology for anything, you know what I mean? Like, they're used to using books, you know, doing research and things like that. You know, that, that's, that's what academia has always been. You know, you go to the library to do research and, you know, and you write papers and, you know, that's, that's how you do things. And that, that's fine, but that's, the world is changing. And also you can't expect to do that when you're studying a group of people that weren't allowed to read and write. Right. That can't be your default way of telling their story when they weren't allowed to do that. So you have to, use other methods to tell their story. Because when you're not allowed to read and write, you're not gonna find their story that way. So you have to think outside of that box and you know, come up with new ways of telling their story. And that's, that's what technology can provide is to tell their stories in a different way instead of the traditional way that, doesn't, that just doesn't apply to them, so. Yeah, right on, thank you. That's why I think it's great. <laughs> Summer, I think you've got the last question. There you go. Um, I think I had a question that was very similar to like Rebecca's question. I was just interested, like, well, first of all, like I echo everything everybody said. This was amazing. Uh, your research is like super important. Thanks. Um, I have a question about like the politics of it. So like you mentioned that a lot of these sites were privately owned. So my question was like, when you go and visit those sites, like I imagine they give you like a tour and that kind of thing. Do you have backstories of like who owns these sites? Like, and in terms of like who owns them, like who are they descendants of whom? Are they descendants of enslaved people? Are they descendants of people who enslaved people? And if so, like how do they view those dwellings? Like what's their relationship with them? Yeah, so it varies. Um, but before I go to any site, I write the property owners a letter and you know, ask permission to come to the site, um, which is which is important, um, especially like if you're in the south somewhere because you, you never know who the property owner is or you know how they might react. 
Um, but it gives them a chance, you know, to check me out and, you know, figure out, you know, why I'm coming, why am I coming to the site? Why do I want to see these buildings? Because it's, it is unusual because usually people that want to come to their site and because they, you know, they, they know they own a historic property. They, the people want to see the main house, but that's not what I'm asking to come see. And so, you know, um, so it gives them an opportunity to feel comfortable with me coming and they, then they can either say yes or no. Um, but I have had very few people say no. And usually the ones that do say no, it's because of like scheduling conflicts. Like it's just not a good time for, um, for their, on their schedule for me to come out there. Um, but yeah, so the people that own the sites, sometimes it is the original family, like the slave owning, the sense of the slave, slave owning family. That is who, still who owns the site. Um, I have not been to a site that the property owner is a descendant of the enslaved family. I have not found that. Um, and, uh, but kind of a lot of times the f person that owns it now has no uh, connection to the original property owners. Um, so they're not descendants of the slave owners or the enslaved um, people there. Um, so in that case, they are usually very interested to learn about it, you know, any history that I can provide for them about the site. Um, and they, they want to learn more. Um, when it's the original family that owns the site, um, then they're usually able to provide me with quite a bit of information um, about the site. They usually have pretty good records about, oh, just kind of various things. Because um, usually then it's a pretty, oh, kind of well-known site in the area locally. And so, you know, it's a kind of well-known family name. Um, it's probably a prominent family, you know, they're still wealthy. Um, so, you know, this is, they have kind of a, information that they can share with me, kind of goes the other way around. Um, so Joby, what do you, what do you, what's your wish for, for what will, what in your kind of hopes and dreams, what happens with the database when you are finished one day, or maybe you will, maybe this is, you know, never, never a finished project, but what's your hope for um, the impact that this is going to have and what might happen next? Um, well, I, I hope that it's never finished, um, that I hope that it becomes a resource for people. And I say that it's never finished because I want it to be like the go-to place for information, that it really is a central repository that, you know, survey work and continues and that, you know, everywhere and, you know, kind of like in each state, you know, there, there are standards that are set up, you know, and each state and different, you know, universities and things like that are each kind of doing their own survey work to see what they have. And this is the place where that information can go and it's publicly available so everyone can utilize it. So then you can go to this database and learn about these structures, you know, in every state and be able to compare them and um, study them. So when places, uh, historic sites, for example, are doing your reconstruction or things in some type of interpretation, then they can be looking at structures that are appropriate for where they are and don't have to keep looking to the same like three presidential sites that they have to right now that aren't, aren't appropriate you know, for a site in Louisiana or Tennessee, because it's not a presidential site in, in Virginia that would be appropriate to look at, you know. So, yeah, so that is my hope is that, you know, it's something that just can continue to grow and um, it's set up so that anyone can add to it. Um, Similar to like the Historic American Building Survey, you know, there's now a set of standards that if you, you know, you follow them and format it correctly, then you can add, you can just continuously add to that. 
Do you see any value in linking these together in some sort of a national register nomination or national historic landmark? Like there are some national register sites that will, you know, collect five or six different locations. Do you see any value for, for this in doing something like that? Um, for some of the sites that I've surveyed? Or even all of them or many of them, depending. I mean, I guess the property owners would have to be on board and maybe not meant, you know, I don't know what percentage would be, but do you think that would be of any value or not really much value? Uh, yes, I think there would. Um, and I think there, oh, sorry. I think there would be how you would do that. Um, yeah, the question, the question is how, and I, I've, that's always kind of in the back of my mind on how you would do that. And I kind of have some ideas. Um, and as I kind of, right, right now, most of my work has been in Virginia. Um, and as I kind of moved to other states, um, I kind of developed that more, but I, I do think there is definitely a value in that. I just, like I said, I think it's, it's kind of how do you do that, that so that it would make sense um, and not just, do it just to do it. I mean, I, I mean, I would, I would say just the mere fact that it's a slave house is of enough value, but I know that's not a good enough argument, you know, to, to a lot of people. So it has to be more than just that, but I definitely do think there's a value to it. And I do think there are some really good um, ways of framing that argument. Well, thank you. Um, it's a little after one. I want to let you go because I think we all know how much you have to do. <laughs> so I don't know that we've ever had a lunch talk speaker where I really, really felt the clock ticking, feeling very thankful, but also a little bit guilty for taking an hour of your time. Um, and I just wanted to express, uh, I'm sure everyone's gratitude for the work that you're doing. Um, and also, I thought that uh, in a complete first, I would unmute everyone um, so that we can all send you off with uh, real applause uh, to kind of show you our gratitude and to, you know, keep your energy up as you go about this just gargantuan and incredibly important project. So thank you, Joby. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, yeah, give her a woohoo too. <laughs> woohoo, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thanks, Joby. Uh, yeah. But yeah, let's stay in, in I mean, let's not stay in touch because you have too much to do. But we will keep following you um, and following the project. And really, thank, thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay. Take care. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah.